La Chine, an enemy fabriqué par la propagande. Is China an enemy fabricated by propaganda? That's the title of a new book by a French-speaking Luxembourgeois author who has devoted decades as a historian on Shizang or Tibet and other China-related issues. His book on Shizang, titled Free Tibet, Power, Society and Ideology in Old Tibet, challenges the so-called Western experts on the issue and the politically correct narratives. Despite having been a lone voice for years, he continues to speak up and dig deeper into how mainstream narratives portray China as the bogeyman. I had the pleasure to sit down with uh, Albert Ettinger, who has authored four books about Xi Zhang, its history and China in general. Mr. Edinger, welcome to The Point. Um, I understand that you have authored two major books on Shizang or Tibet. One is called Free Tibet, question mark, State, Society and Ideology in Old Tibet, and Fight for okay. Tibet, History, Background and Perspectives on an International Conflict. That's almost 10 years ago. And most recently, this year actually, you published another book, which is called China, an Enemy Fabricated by Propaganda. In, in this book, you actually covered quite a number of topics, such as Hong Kong, such as Taiwan, and Tibet, and Xinjiang as well. So first of all, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, how come, I understand you were a teacher, how come you started um, being interested in these questions and started writing about your perspectives on these questions? Yes. Um, my story about China goes back uh, quite long, quite a long time. I, I um, went already in, to China in the 70s. So uh, you see, I'm of older age. And um, I was uh, interested in China all, all, all this time. And um, I was um, um, confronted to the Tibet question, if you want. Um, as a teacher, because in our school book, in, uh, I was uh, teaching German literature um, in the secondary school, and um, in the school book we had this uh, subject, but it was from a very biased um, perspective. So um, I was interested in um, in uh, searching deeper, let's say, and um, uh, then I, 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 I began to, I, I decided finally in 2008, it's the year of the Olympic Games in Beijing, and uh, there was a, a huge propaganda campaign uh, against China, and uh, Tibet, the Tibet subject was very important. So, so then I decided to, to, to dig deeper and to, to publish something about it, and uh, at, at the end, uh, the result were these uh, two books, yeah, two two major books. Um, I understand. I've read other interviews of you. I understand that before you write these books, you had actually not been to Tibet or Shizang. You only no, no. you you only dug into the materials that you could find, and you mm -hmm. found incoherences, right, inaccuracies in these uh, Western narratives. And you in your oh, yes. in your book. Yeah, you fundamentally challenged some of the opinions that are considered authoritative in uh, in Tibetology mm -hmm. in Western society, such as Alexandra David Nail, just to cite one name, because her views are written in textbooks in Europe as if they are, you know, the represent representation of truth. Um, how could you? How did you do it? I mean, without being into Tibet, what did you do in the literature that you could find being in Europe to find these loopholes? Um, first, I, I have a, an advantage uh, being a Luxembourger. I know uh, several languages and I could read books in uh, both in, in German and in French and in English. And so I uh, discovered, for example, one of my first main sources was a uh, um, uh, was Harar, who is uh, the, the author of the Seven Years of Tibet uh, in, in Tibet, a uh, famous book, a best uh, international bestseller. And um, I uh, noticed that um, the French edition and the British edition was um, uh, in, in, in the, those books, um, uh, whole passages were omitted. 
they were censored because um, they didn't fit in the in the normal in the, in the narrative about Tibet. So um, this was was one one uh, one important uh, thing I, I, I discovered, and uh, I found it even uh, later also in, in in other in other books that uh, sometimes there are corrections, there are omissions, um, uh, just of of, of those, uh, those things who who don't match with um, the, the Western narrative. So you you find some some things that um, that. Um, don't match so well with this um, idealistic view of uh, or sweetened view of, of, of uh, ancient Tibet, and uh, and so on. If uh, I, I began reading uh, um, uh, what what uh, some uh, early visitors of Tibet wrote about um, what they saw, what they uh, what they uh, witnessed, and so so I had first hand. Let's say uh, descriptions of what what they and uh, yeah mm -hmm. stories what they told about Tibet. Yeah. So you discovered these paragraphs which were very much critical of what old Tibet was like, and yet when Tibet was introduced in Western textbooks, it gave an idealized image, right? Exactly. Uh, concept of this region, yeah. and you thought that, that is not correct. Um, let's jump a little bit. Let's let's maybe come back to Tibet in just a moment, because Tibet is just one of the topics where similar um, problems exist. Actually, in your very latest book called China, an enemy that's fabricated by propaganda, you um, took on an enemy, a very powerful enemy, which is the mainstream media, right? Of course. Which is the, yeah. And uh, why do you say that? Why do you say that China is an enemy that's fabricated by propaganda? Because I think that uh, there are no uh, no problems between uh, Europe, for example, and, and, and China. Um, uh, China is not really a geopolitical rival of, of any any major um, uh, European country. It's a rival of the United States, and uh, it has been declared. Uh, to be a rival and even an enemy of the United States by the United States, not by China, and so I think that uh, it lays in, in, the, in the best interest of uh, Europe and of the European countries to have good relations with uh, with China, and um, uh, unfortunately uh, the, the the narrative, the, the mainstream media, and so on, is controlled or are controlled by by the United States and uh, by people who. who to work for the United States, to, so um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the narrative is, is very biased, and um, I, I try to to redress this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Could you could you give an example, an outstanding example of why the narrative ex is extremely biased? Oh. <laughs> Uh, this is a whole uh, long list of, of examples. It's difficult to, tr to choose one. But, um, now for example, in, in general, China is perceived in, in the Western media as a dystopian society and uh, as a country, uh, as an aggressive country, aggressive uh, towards the, the neighbors and, 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 and so on. And, uh, yeah, I find this very biased because I... I, I when I look at uh, Chinese um, foreign policy, for example, I, I see policy of uh, of, um, of peace and of uh, peaceful coexistence since the, the existence of the People's Republic. And uh, I don't see any aggressivity um, uh, except uh, if you want if you want to characterize it as ag aggressive that China uh, wants to hold uh, its uh, its uh, own territory and it wants to to uh, reunify with uh, with uh, Taiwan, for example, but that's not not aggressive. I find it much more aggressive when when uh, warships, uh, uh, American and even now European, French and German warships, cross the Taiwan Strait, uh, whereas uh, China never never crossed the I don't know uh, the, the 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 channel uh, between England and, uh, and and the continent. So uh, I, I find that uh, this characterization of China as aggressive is, is completely biased. 
Well, some people would say, just being an advocate, some people would say, how can you say all the media, all the different media are working for the United States? They would question you, right? They would say that these media, first of all, work for different countries. They come from different country. Um, they are not, some of them are funded not by the government. Some of them are, um, you know, not uh, only affiliated with the, with the state and they are not, um, you know, how can you say they are all working for the United States? For example, in Germany and in France, there is a huge network, America, Atlantic uh, ne network, if you want, who, who, who promotes um, uh, American interests. And uh, there are young leader programs and so on uh, since uh, the end of the uh, Second World War, when, when, the, when the Americans came uh, to, to Europe with troops and so on. And uh, since then, uh, we, we, we have... Uh, the, we, we assist with the establishment of, of, of this kind of, of network. And uh, uh, this is one side. Uh, they, have, they have people um, who, um, who are part of these networks in the media. They have people in politics, in um, the economy also, in the, the institutions. And so uh, they have a, a strong influence. It's what's, what's, what is called um, the, the soft power of the USA. And the soft power is very, very strong. Uh, and then you have the news agencies, who are mainly uh, American also, and the uh, uh, newspapers like New York Times or Washington Post. They are they are really the, the, they, they have a, a huge influence also on on, on Western media in general. And uh, often Western media they they don't have even uh, the possibility uh, the capacity of of, of um, um, having everywhere some reporters and so on. So they copy what, what the New York Times writes. And um, so there are a lot of, a lot of, of strings, let's see, let's say that up, up with, by, by, um, by the American um, elites. Yeah. How much is prejudice, bias, part of this? Um, do you, because uh, one thing is to have deliberate campaign, you know, to make China look bad. The other is, mm -hmm. um, I, I perceive there's a mm -hmm. inherent or long-standing bias that, that comes, um, comes out um, without knowing almost. I don't know whether you see Absolutely. that mm -hmm. as, part of, as part of the problem as well. Absolutely, yes. Um, I think that China never had a very good press in the Occident, uh, in, the, in the, the West. Um, uh, since the, the, the establishment of the, the uh, People's Republic, at least, uh, there was the, the Cold War and uh, the fear of communism. And um, uh, so it goes back to this time, this uh, time of, of Cold War. But even before, we have uh, our, our countries were all uh, colonizing uh, China or trying to colonize China. Uh, French had colonies, Germans had colonies, British had, of course, colonies. Uh, and uh, and the Americans they had a uh, huge um, economic uh, interest and influence also so um, uh, yeah it, it goes back to to this colonial uh, view of the world also I I have uh, often the expression the impression that uh, still uh, most uh, or a lot of Europeans have this uh, old view of of of, uh, of the world not only uh, of China but. Uh, of whole Asia and of uh, Africa and so on. Yeah. How susceptible are the general public towards this kind of narrative? Do you think um, they are buying to this kind of narrative with readily, or are they are there certain critical regards, as I say, or you know, some people will think about it critically, or are they taking it in as if these are facts? Um, I think that uh, most people don't think about it. <laughs> it's a problem that uh, people are not so much interested in, in foreign policy, and uh, so uh, most people don't think about it and they buy it. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of people who who know China, who maybe visit China, and uh, who, who listen to alternative media, uh, who who, uh, who are critical and who, who don't buy it. But uh, but I think. I'm afraid most people buy it without thinking about it. Yeah. Mm. How so? Because if you think about the level of education, the living standard, you would feel that uh, 
um, you would have the impression that people would be more critical thinkers and they would be more sophisticated in terms of their consumption of information. Is that the case? I don't think so. Uh, people are interested in, in material things, in their material well-being, uh, much more than in politics normally. We have, we, have a, we have a population that is not very politicized, I think. It's not very interested in, uh, above all, not interested in, in foreign policy. And, 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 and they, people believe what they read in the newspapers mostly. So, um, and the journalists who could know better, especially, they are interested in not knowing better because if they know better and they write something uh, they shouldn't, they have uh, maybe career problems. So it's better for them to not to look too close, closely and so on, on things. Yeah. You're talking about, peer pressure, you're talking about groupthink and the pressure exactly. of it? Exactly, exactly. About uh, conforming to uh, to the, the general uh, opinion of, of uh, and, and the politically uh, to, to the political elites and, and their, their, their opinions and views. But people are talking about Western society being a free, open society, being a, a society where you have freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of thoughts, there's, mm -hmm. you know, no or little censorship, but what you are saying uh, seems to point to quite different a picture. Yeah, there is no no official censor censorship, but uh, censorship exists. And uh, uh, for example, I can I can say that uh, my books, for example, were, were not reviewed by any major newspaper in Luxembourg, even. And uh, publishing of this kind of books in Luxembourg is a rare thing, so <laughs> rare event. So. Uh, uh, but but uh, nobody ever asked me for an interview in Luxembourg or in or in France even or in, in Germany. And my first book, my my books were first uh, published in Germany, and I was on uh, in uh, on some uh, how you call it uh, book fairs in Germany and uh, yeah, press the press was never interested in anything I I I've said so um, uh, even even. Uh, even a crit there were no critical uh, questions or no critical uh, reactions uh, to anything I, I wrote. So um, I can can give you another example. I don't know if you you know the French filmmaker uh, Jean-Michel Carré. He made a, a huge documentary about about uh, China maybe ten years ago, and uh, for Arte. The, the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the French German TV and station. French yeah. German, yeah. And he he, um, he made um, a documentary about Tibet too, uh, recently, more recently. And he had huge problems to uh, to have it accepted by Arte. He uh, there was a lot of censorship. And for example, I since I know him, uh, he interviewed me too for his uh, his documentary, mm. and. Um, the responsible uh, man at Arte, he refused immediately to let me in this uh, speak in this uh, documentary, and some other people also. They they were banned immediately, and um, they checked uh, every wording uh, in in this in this documentary, and he had to re remake it uh, uh, several times to change uh, different um, uh, wordings and so on, and uh, the narrative a little bit. Uh, and and um, at the end, um, after maybe two or three years of discussions and uh, quarrels and so on, uh, the um, the this uh, documentary was was uh, not not uh, shown finally, and uh, there were some uh, anti-Chinese uh, scholars or intellectuals, and they wrote they they uh, immediately alerted uh, other people and they wrote a letter so that. Um, that it was dropped by Arte and it was dropped by Belgian uh, state TV. This is uh, censorship. We have this censorship, but it's it's behind curtain, the curtain. You don't see it normally. <laughs> and normally it, it works uh, easier because people conform to what what, uh, what uh, is asked for, yeah. for from them. So Jean-Michel, he was an exception. Yeah, I see that, for instance, uh, you talked about your book in the Frank Frankfurt Book Fair as well, and you made a video of it, but it's a very, how should I say, it's a very lonely voice, you know, you... Yeah, of course, um, of course, yeah. Yeah, and, and I could feel the kind of uh, absolute 
um, non-interest, you know, or display of non-interest to topics, because this is a very difficult topic to write, because your enemy is very for formidable. You're not only taking on a some monks, you're taking on a whole narrative, you're taking on the army of, <laughs> an ethic of uh, journalists, you know, basically yeah. you're saying what you have been saying is wrong. And that is a very courageous thing to do. Uh, why do you do that? Do, do you feel in any way strong pressure for for keep doing what you're doing? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I think uh, that the, the truth is, is uh, has to come out, and uh, uh, I cannot accept uh, injustice, and I, I, I cannot accept lies. So <laughs> I have to I have to uh, to do something about it. But uh, I must say I'm 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 uh, fortunate maybe because. Uh, I feel quite uh, quite safe because I, I I have not no no career before me. Uh, I I'm, I'm uh, of an age I'm retired, so I uh, I have no there's there's no risk not not the same risk as for young young journalists, for example, to mm. to tell the truth. So I'm uh, I'm assuming it. I, <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you were writing these books, you had not been to Tibet, but later on, you actually had the opportunity to go to Tibet. Tell us about these trips and uh, uh, whether what you wrote, you know, in the books were shored up, were verified by what you saw. Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, I must say that uh, I wrote, I, 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 I've written mostly about, about older Tibet and about the uh, history of Tibet. So it was not so important to having been to, to Tibet to actually because uh, I, I, um, I wrote about about the past. But um, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I could measure the, 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 the whole the gap between what was Tibet before because I, I knew it by reading and so on of uh, people who visited Tibet and, and uh, Tibet uh, uh, present time Tibet. So this I, I, I could really see very well. And uh, I saw a country that has a huge, has had a huge development, the huge modernization of infrastructure, of, of um, well-being of, of people. Um, I saw a country that um, cherished still the, the, the traditions. You have, you have, I saw a lot of monks, maybe even too, too many for my, my taste, <laughs> and a lot of, of pilgrims and, and so on in the Barkra and, and so on. So, so uh, this doesn't match at, at all with what, uh, what we are told in, in, in Europe and in the USA. Mm. Um, the first time I went, I went by plane from Beijing. Uh, immediately to when Lhasa. Was that? Oh, it, it's already nearly ten years. Ten years ago, I think, nine, okay. eight nine years ago. I don't know. And uh, and uh, another time, I went uh, now by the new um, highway. Yeah, it's uh, tremendous if you know that uh, Tibet was completely closed uh, before 1915 and uh, 50, and uh, there were no roads at all in in whole t whole of Tibet. First roads were, were built by by Chinese, um, by the Chinese PLA, and and afterwards all this infrastructure that you see, if you, all the bridges and all, the, yeah, it's it's impressive, it's, it's impressive, impressive. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I remember you were writing about um, Western um, records by Huxley, for instance, when he first went to Lhasa, and his description of Lhasa was just uh, um, appalling, you know, how abject the conditions were, and yet people seem not to um, uh, put that against what they're reading in the popular mainstream description of the old Tibet, the idealized place. Anyway, if you look at, you know, this kind of huge gaps and appalling incoherences what do you take away as the as the core of the fallacy that we're trying to fight against? And I'm saying this not just not just for the Europeans or the Americans or, or, or Chinese, for, for people everywhere. What do we really have to be mindful of when we are taking in information about a place that we have never been to, that we don't know much, or even we've heard about, but we don't know much? What do you think is the biggest lesson that 
we have to constantly remind ourselves of when we understand this world. For for me, the lesson is to not to believe what uh, what uh, mainstream media uh, uh, are writing or saying. Um, take it with a grain of salt. Every taking everything with a grain of salt, and uh, uh, the best is looking looking deeper, digging deeper, and 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 go go and visit, uh, especially for China. Go and visit China, and uh, you see you'll see that uh, it's quite different from from everything you. You uh, you hear and you see in, mm. in, in the West. Mm. Um, uh, hope uh, yeah, it's it's a good thing that now um, we can even come uh, without visa. It's visa free for 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 two weeks, yeah. I think, uh, uh, visiting China. And uh, I would I would wish to um, that that this would would also be um, true for 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 Tibet because uh, Tibet is still a little bit um, uh, journey in Off Tibet is still a little moment. bit restricted. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully this this will yeah. change. But uh, for other places, for Xinjiang, for instance, and now people it's can completely, go. It's completely, completely yeah, open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But uh, for Tibet, of course, it it's uh, of course of it's uh, because of the the history of the place. Because uh, there were these uh, all these um, turmoil, turmoil, and and so on, uh, um, mm. and um, and of course, uh, there, and there were some some. Uh, some times where where people could travel, also foreigners could travel very freely, and uh, even without special visas and so on. Mm. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 important to to go uh, to the places and to to speak yeah. to people and uh, and to to hear the other to see the other side of the of the coin. Let's say. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Albert Ettinger, for sharing with us your insights.